Okay, uh, welcome and good day to you all. This is the third webinar of the SLV webinar series, and in fact, the second <coughs> webinar of the clinical uh, series. Uh, so it's absolutely pleasure to welcome you um, all from different parts of the world. And like the previous seminars, uh, we have the structure. The structure of this seminar would be first we'll have a uh, about one to one and a half hour lecture. And then followed by a Q&A session. Uh, during the Q&A session, you can ask either live questions or else you can uh, text the uh, questions to the chat box of the Zoom platform so that those questions also will be incorporated into the uh, Q&A session. Uh, and also please note that this uh, program goes live uh, in our YouTube channel. So those who want to participate through YouTube channel can participate uh, so. And also, uh, announcement, uh, please mute your microphones uh, so that we can have an uninterrupted session uh, lecture. And uh, before we actually start the lecture, I would like to invite Dr. Randika Gunawadana, President SLVA, to welcome all of you. Uh, yes, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Chandika. I think everybody can hear me, right? Hello. Yes. yes. Yeah. So, uh, uh, you are all, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Hello. Hello. Can I talk now? Thank you very much, Dr. Chandika. I think everybody can hear me, right? Hello. Hello. Yes, President. Yes, uh, I think you yeah, can ladies and gentlemen. Yeah. yeah. Yes, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, welcome <coughs> you all today for this uh, uh, webinar series conducted by the Sri Lanka Veterinary Association. So, my dear colleagues and uh, senior veterinarians, my teachers and uh, other colleagues and. Uh, the practicing veterinarians in local and overseas, and especially the members who are joining with us here today from the overseas to this virtual platform. Uh, you all are warmly welcome to, for today's uh, webinar conducted by Sri Lanka Veterinary Association. Actually, this is the third webinar we are conducted uh, during the pandemic situation through online. So uh, I must uh, happy to say that uh, the last webinar conducted uh, with Dr. Senura from Australia, it was quite successful and fruitful. Uh, we got a massive number of participants even from overseas, and it was highly enthusiastic and for us also as well. And meantime, if I tell the Sri Lanka Veterinary Association activities also currently, we are just engaged in the COVID pandemic uh, infestation for the lion uh, in the zoo. And uh, we are just currently involved to uh, uh, evacuate the myths uh, 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 disseminated in the public sector these days. So we are currently active in that activities. And uh, meantime, uh, I uh, remind you all to pay your, uh, I mean, uh, the uh, 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 meantime, I uh, invite you all to renew your memberships with the SLVA and so that we can just uh, provide you a good uh, service further it, with good uh, high stand of monetary uh, status in the SLVA. And it's a kind reminder for you all to all our members. So once again, I welcome and uh, I hope Dr. Bhagya today here with us uh, from Australia is a very uh, good member of Sri Lanka Veterinary Association. He's a quite capable uh, surgeon who got the membership of uh, surgeons in uh, Australia. So everybody will get a good home take home message today. And I, I invite you to uh, in, enjoy the session and uh, have a good uh, lecture today. Thank you very much. All are welcome again. Thank you, Dr. Randika. So now I would like to invite Dr. Sugat Premachandra, Secretary SLVA, uh, to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Bhagya. Good afternoon. Thank you very much, Dr. Chandika. Uh, it's a pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Bhagya. He uh, graduated from University of Peradana in 2005 uh, with BBSA honors degree. He 
completed the national veterinary exam in 2009 he is a member member of the australia and new zealand college of veterinary scientist he had worked in general practice since 2010 to 2017 currently he is working as a director of the avadu animal clinic australia he has a special interest on orthopedic and soft tissue surgery uh, i would like to invite dr bagya to conduct the session thank you thank you very much sagar that thank you for the introduction and uh, thank you very much for the um, sri lanka veterinary association for organizing this event and also um, inviting me to do to do a session as well and um, you know i hope uh, this will be a, a useful session so the today's topic um, that i'm going to talk about is um, cruciate ligament rupture and this is this is a very common condition um in the industry and is a big condition in uh, in the industry uh, but i think in 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 particular in sri lanka this condition probably is a little bit overlooked um so i, I thought it it will it is it is a good idea to uh, talk about it uh, um it to get get this uh, deserved attention to this uh, particular condition um So with the today's session what we're going to talk about is first of all you know briefly talk about why we worry about this condition the significance of, of the of the condition and then uh, we'll briefly talk about the pathophysiology um, of of it and why it happens and why it happens so commonly that sort of a thing then um, I'm going to talk about uh, how to diagnose this condition um practically um sometimes things written in textbooks is very difficult to um, you know to um, use um, in in real practice you know the dogs um, you know we all uh, are practitioners sometimes it's difficult to understand or right, um, how we how we understand what's happening and the third um, then then we will talk about the treatment options um, of this condition and after that I'll talk about uh, uh, one of the is um, one of the surgical techniques that we can uh, you know use to treat for this condition um, effectively and um, all right so we'll we'll start with the um with the significance okay so this is the most common cause of um, hind leg injury um uh, hind leg lameness uh, in in dogs uh, in western dogs. like you know everybody knows about it because of it and and um, excuse me dr bagge can i disturb you for a while yeah that's okay yes have, have you started the screen sharing doctor yes can you see it or yes it... yeah we can see that uh, so all right okay okay so going okay yes yeah everything is okay sorry all right that's okay so we are talking about the significance so that this is the most common um, cause of hind leg lameness like if a adult dog comes um, you know limping from a back leg so always we should suspect um, the cruciate ligament and um, the and 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 this is the most common orthopedic surgery performed in western world um, like 85% of the orthopedic surgeries are cruciate surgeries so it is it is a really really common common condition and over billion spent one of the paper i saw that they uh, spend a billion um, dollars every year for this particular condition uh, in uh, united states alone and uh, there are large number of te- surgical techniques described in, in literature or, or hundreds of techniques there yeah. and it happens in all type of breeds so so why this cruciate ligament rupture um why why only cruciate ligament what there are so many ligaments in the body why um, only this uh, this particular ligament rupture so that's the first question came into my head like when i first you know heard about this condition um so to understand that we also do the uh, anatomy of the um of the I hope everyone can hear me. 
um, is it fair to use the word fiction in a historical aspect of the style of work? The Thema uh, and, and uh, Tibia, and, and then uh, the, the crucial ligament is, uh, is the structure written uh, in shown here, and it's uh, cranially um, connected to the tibia, and it's, it's uh, coldly um, attached to the, um, the femur. And there's uh, the caudal cruciate ligament um, that runs in opposite direction. And there are two other ligaments, um, the medial collateral ligament and the lateral, lateral ligament, and then uh, the medial meniscus uh, there, that's a cartilage cushioning um, structure, and there is another um, lateral meniscus on the other side as well. Excuse me, Dr. Bagge, sorry to disturb you again. Yes. Uh, the voice is not really clear to us. Okay. Uh, I think if you get the like uh, microphone to your like uh, close to the mouth area, that could be. Okay. How, how is it now? Is it a bit better? Yeah, that, yeah that's, that's better. Yes, definitely. I'll get it a bit closer. Yeah. Sorry about that. So we were talking about the, the, the stifle joint anatomy. And uh, so the, the, this little illustration shows where the cranial cruciate ligament is. It attached to the, um, uh, the tibia cranially and, um, and according to the femur. And, and there is another ligament called cordon cruciate ligament that runs in the opposite direction. And uh, there are two collateral ligaments, the lateral collateral ligament and the medial uh, collateral ligament. And there are two uh, cartilage cushioning called menisci, um, medial meniscus and the lateral meniscus. That's uh, on either side. Um, the other, other important structure that's not shown in, the, uh, in this illustration is uh, the patella tendon and the patella that's, uh, that's, uh, that's at the front there and the distribual tuberosity as the front here as well. Um, so when dogs standing, their um, stifle joint is in a slight flexion, um, like roughly about like maybe 100, 110 to 130 degrees angle when they're standing. And always there is a force, um, in, just like shown in the picture below, force um, forward. And, and, and that's a, that shearing force is neutralized by this ligament. So that directly applies on that cranial cruciate ligament uh, all the time when bearing weight. So that's probably why this ligament is under constant strain. And probably why that, that ligament's happened that commonly because caudal cruciate ligament ruptures is very rare. And, and other, other ligament injuries are generally related to hit by a car, that sort of a trauma type, uh, trauma type um, uh, uh, incidents. Uh, but this cranial cruciate ligament um, the ruptures even with, uh, you know, the dogs without any specific trauma, like even when they, um, in, with, with sort of a normal, normal in walking and normal sort of activities, but still they uh, get this ligament damage probably because this constant shear force is applying through that ligament. Uh, so when we looked at the causes of um, cruciate, um, the cranial cruciate ligament rupture, and, and um, the, there, are, there are few. Uh, the, the most common reason to rupture um, is a progressive degeneration of this um, ligament. Uh, the exact cause is not very well understood, but almost all um, dogs with this cruciate damage, or most of them, have some um, osteoarthritis um, in the joint. And, and probably why that's why um, you know, we think that uh, it may be underlying Degeneration, degenerative changes of the of the ligament, and 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 that's why it ruptures even with normal forces. And and um, the other other important thing is um, the if if one a cruciate ligament ruptures on one side, and then the contralateral cruciate ligament um, that is uh, the cruciate ligament of the other leg ruptures very commonly. Like if we 
If we see a little bit of arthritis in both knees with, um, with radiographs, um, even though there wasn't any lameness on the other leg, but if we see some osteoarthritis uh, changes, uh, that cruciate ligament ruptures like about 60% within, within, uh, within uh, 24 months. So it is, it is very, very common uh, that it ruptures when there is an underlying arthritis. So that's, that's another thing. The other thing is that we talk about the conformation uh, of, the, of, the, of the stifle when they're standing and that standing angle. So TPA is um, the tibial plateau angle. So this name um, uh, is, is commonly used when we talk about cruciate ligament and, and its treatment options and things like that. We will um, look at it a little bit later. What is tibial plateau angle? That's, that's the angle of the knee, basically. And, and when the angle of the knee is um, more, the strain is more. So there's more, more forces going through the ligament. And that, that's basically the significance of it. And uh, the other thing is obesity. The obese dogs ruptures the cruciate ligament more. And lack of fitness as well. Like you know, so the fit, um, you know, dogs who do regular exercise, regular activities, and they the, the the fitness level also shown um, uh, associated with the with the ruptures too. So this is the most common reason. The really this could be purely because of the trauma as well. Like uh, you know, start excessive loading. That means jumping, like uh, jumping and 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 landing on the. On the ground, and because of this excessive excessive loading, uh, that could happen. And hyper hyper extension of the stifle or internal rotation um, when uh, during exercise or running or you know catching ball and that kind of activities. And the the interesting thing is, like when we take X rays, uh, there are no osteopyptosis or you know the uh, uh, radiographic evidence of osteoarthritis if the if we see these patients initially. The other important thing you need to remember is if it's a young dog, uh, like if, when there is growth plates, and uh, like particularly when they're younger than like eight months or so, they, the crew, it's, it's rare to rupture the actual ligament. Instead of that, it evolves from the tibial attachment. And, but the clinical signs are very similar and we diagnosed uh, as well, but the treatment is a little different to those ones. But all the other, if it, even though it's a traumatic rupture of the actual ligament, or if it is a, um, a degener degeneration associated uh, cruciate, uh, cruciate rupture, that the treatments are the same. Uh, just the avulsion um, is slightly different. It needs, uh, like we can reattach the um, actual um, avuls uh, part of the ligament. But the other, uh, with the others, the treatments are different, which we're going to talk about. All right. Uh, so next we'll talk. Now I want to show you um, the, the classic presentation of this condition. That's why I have this little video with one of my patients. And, and this is how typically they walk um, when they freshly rupture the cruciate ligament, like within a week or so. But this clinical presentation is very, very, um, you will understand why um, later on as well, because um, it, it depends on their time of presentation and also um, whether the both legs are ruptured and uh, other underlying causes at the same time as well. But if this is about more than 80% of the time, this is how they present. Um, and um, usually this lameness get worse um, after the exercise and, um, and improves uh, with rest. Like if you naturally rest the dog and, and usually improves uh, with the lameness, but never goes away. And so it is, it is described as a obvious weight bearing lameness. Um, and usually with an acute onset. So that, that, this kind of lameness is typical with it. All right, so now um, physical examination. So this is a little bit tricky sometimes. 
Um, but um, almost all the time, there is a pain at the stifle. Very important to understand that because that's when we know that that's, um, that's where we need to look for. Like the, um, particularly with the stifle extension, the extended uh, stifle joint, and uh, with clear pain. And it's very easy to compare both. And then we can see, um, you know, if the ruptured side definitely there's a little bit of pain. And um, it's, it's a good idea, with, even with normal dogs who have that practice, so then we know how much um, reaction you normally get from an from a average dog with the, when there is no rupture. Um, the second, uh, second thing is a sit test. This is not, even though this is, um, this is quite common, but it is not present in all the time, when they sit, usually they uh, they affected leg. Um, you know, they sit like affected leg projecting out. Like um, say in this picture, the the affected uh, affected stifle is this one. So normally they they leave it out. Um, that's another sign. And the other one is particularly with the chronic uh, cruciate ruptures, like when the things uh, happening over time. So we see this medial buttress, which is the uh, periarticular fibrosis. And, and usually when we palpate both, both knees, we can see uh, this probably there's a difference. And also uh, if we get used to uh, normal stifles, you know, as having a practice of you know, feeling the inside of the knee all the time, and then we can you know, palpate and feel a difference in these dogs, particularly when, they, when these ruptures uh, become more chronic. And the, uh, and the other, other clinical sign is the cranial thigh muscles, the quadricep muscle um, atrophy. Um, usually that muscles get um, atrophy, uh, and that is uh, usually uh, become obvious after that in these um, The other um, specific things which we're going to talk about in a tiny bit more detail, um, for, there is a specific test, two tests basically, one is cranial drawer test, and the other one is cranial tibial thrust um, and uh, or cranial compression tibial compression test. Um, so what is so the usual to do these things? Usually needs a little bit of sedation in most dogs, but in some dogs you can feel it um, in their conscious as well. Um, I always attempt to uh, test it when they are conscious, and um, at least then I know that it is painful. Um, at this time. Um, oh, so in this uh, little illustration shows uh, when the cruciate ligament ruptures, um, the, the tibia uh, can be moved forward. Um, you know, that's, a, that's the movement that we feel in the cranial door test. And um, I have a little video after this. Uh, to show uh, how we act when, when you actually feel it, how, how do you feel it? Um, it's a really, really good practice that you try to feel this in each and every door. You know, when, even though when you desex a door, it's a good, good practice to have a little feel uh, of the knee. Um, normally, you put um, the leg on, uh, you know, uh, on the side when the dog is lying on the side, lateral recumbency, and then uh, you keep that. Uh, the, the leg that you want to test uh, on the uh, on the top, um, and then uh, it then filled out. Then you will see how to do that in the next uh, uh, next slide. Um, uh, but two things we need to remember: one is uh, in young dogs, really young dogs, um, you might feel a little bit of movement in in that uh, that knee joint, and that's that's physiological. It's called puppy drawer. And that can get confused a little bit, like, oh, because there's a crucial rupture. But and the, the, the simplest thing is, like, they're not limp. They, they don't limp at all. So if the if dog is not limping, but if you feel a little bit of movement in a young dog, that could be perfectly normal. Um, and the other thing is that you could also, sometimes you might get a puppy um, that's limping from the back leg, but uh, when you examine it, you might feel that little movement, and then sometimes that can get confused with the actual cause. So when your crucial ligament is ruptured, uh, that's a common, common um, confusing thing. I think the best thing is to get used to it. Like 
particularly when we tease at young dogs, when they are anesthetic, it's a really good habit to have a little, little, uh, little feel of the knee when we get used to that uh, normal, normal physiological movement. Um, the other thing is it has a sudden, uh, you know, a sudden uh, uh, end point when you're feeling it. When you, when the, when the tibia moves forward, it stops suddenly, and and uh, that doesn't happen with the cranial cushion ligament ruptured dogs. It, it moves a bit further forward, and it's a little bit more elastic sort of feeling. Um, and the other thing is, uh, there are partial ruptures. So this cushion ligament is actually a collection of uh, many things, like a root. And it has two components as well. There are two bands. Um, one is called um, cranial medial band, and the other one is um, called, um, uh, called, lateral, called lateral band. So the, when the, the partial rupture means um, this, this, um, this rope type ligament, sometimes some of the threads could be, could be a rupture, but it is still attached. And, and uh, so we won't feel, uh, feel the movement much. And particularly, um, so the absence of this uh, movement doesn't mean that there is no uh, cruciate ligament rupture. But if there is a movement, that is diagnostic for this condition. So, in this video, um, this is me feeling the um, doing the actual uh, cranial dual test. So I'm holding uh, the tibia from my right hand and uh, holding the proximal proximal distal femur from the left hand. So when it is ruptured, this is a fresh, complete rupture. So it has a clear, classic. Um, um, and that is a positive uh, cranial dual test. So this is another test. Um, this is more useful for large dogs like great beans and uh, anything bigger than like 50 kilos or something, massive and things like that. So it's a bit difficult to get into your hand. Uh, and then also some practitioners like this test too for some reason, but it's not really common. Right? Most people do the dual test. With this one, you know, um, when the dog's standing, you can do that as well. When they're standing, uh, you hold the leg uh, right through the picture there. When you flex the hop, um, and you will feel that cranial movement of the, the, the tibial tuberosity. And, and, uh, and, and that getting used to it, it takes some time to um, get used to this test. Once you get used to that, and, and, uh, and then, uh, then you can do it. So this can be done while on the anesthesia. As well, and, and even in conscious ways. So now um, we'll talk about the radiographs and how we, uh, so the next diagnostic step is first we examine them and we definitely we need to know that stifle is painful at least. Uh, and then we try to do the draw test sometimes, you know, most of the time you can feel a, feel a moment, that's diagnostic. But in some dogs, when there is partial ruptures, um, uh, or when there is uh, impact, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the partial ruptures, um, the, the draw test is, you can't feel a clear draw on the side. Um, and then it, these radiographs are very important to diagnose this condition. Regardless, we take radiographs in uh, every, um, every dog um, that we suspect even though there's a dual sign percent, um, that to rule out um, other concurrent conditions such as you know, particularly osteosarcoma and, and, you know, and also to understand uh, other reasons. So particularly, we take um, hips uh, and both stifles, always take reviews. Um, hips are you normally take in you know, extended hip reviews, um, try to keep both the most parallel and Lying on the uh, dorsal recumbency, and that view uh, is very important. I normally include the stifles in it too. If, if I see the stifles clearly, so I wouldn't worry 
Dr. Bhagya, again, the voice is not very clear to us. Sorry. Could you hear most of it, what I said before? Or is it just, just starting to... Um, yeah, now it's better, Doctor. Is it better? Oh, sorry about yeah. that. Okay. Did you hear... And also, the... you, can, uh, you can, I think, enlarge the screen also, like... Uh, Mm. Is, is there an option there to Dr. Sugat, no, can you yeah. guide uh, Dr. Bhagya? I, uh, in yeah. my screen, uh, what I see is just the, uh, uh, you know, the presentation mode. I don't see anything else. Even the yeah. chat. Uh, Dr. Bhagya, that is not uh, your problem, but uh, so everyone, uh, you can enlarge your screen from your end. There's, there's a, uh, a way to do that. Thank you. All right, okay. Okay, Chandika. Dr. Bhagya, you can continue. Okay, sorry about that. All right, with the radio gas, I was talking about how to take the x-rays. So we'll take extended, um, you know, hips and both lateral stifles. Even though we suspect uh, one leg is lame, I would always take both legs. Uh, it's very useful information. Um, and, and, and to talk about the future of the other leg as well. Um, and, and always two views um, as, as you do. Um, all right, so the typical changes of the stifle, there are two pictures on this slide. Um, so one on the top is the one with cruciate ligament rupture, and the other one is a normal stifle. So just to see. So the, the things what we see uh, commonly is, the most common thing that we expect is this joint effusion, um, the arrow shown here. So if you look at the, the normal knee, um, so the parapatellar pad pad, fat pad, which is, so this is the patellar tendon. And see this little black, uh, black part is the uh, fat pad of the, uh, uh, of the stifle called parapatellar pad pad. And see this other, uh, the heaviness in here uh, is is the um, joint effusion, joint fluid. In a normal stifle, there is only very little. So this one is here, uh, and this it's almost not visible. But it's a clear triangular um, the shape of the black blackness in there, and that's usually absent. So that's that's classic with uh, cruciate ligament ruptures. It's a really good idea to have a look, um, you know, again and again about, um, on, on the X-rays that you had in the past to get used to it. Uh, they will always be saying, oh, there's effusion in this joint, there is no much effusion in the other joint. That can't be. The other things are um, the osteophytes associated with the um, osteoarthritis. So in the, in the distal patella, uh, osteophytes, and there's a trochlea, uh, a trochlea um, associated with Osteophytes, and sometimes this cerella um, has osteophytes as well. And uh, yeah, that kind of changes. So if we see any uh, osteoarthritis changes, and that's, but if we see osteo, if, if you don't see any other cause but osteoarthritis of a stifle, and that is generally considered as a cruciate ligament rupture, uh, unless proven otherwise. So it's about 99% of the time, it is because of the cruciate Um That's probably the simplest way to remember. Um, all right, so now we'll um, talk about the treatment options um, of uh, cruciate And so the, the, the conservative treatments and the surgery, surgery treatments. So the conservative mean um, cage resting for about four to six weeks and um, probably use some anti-inflammatories uh, uh, as needed uh, for the pain, particularly for the first one or two weeks and uh, then as needed. Um, this is shown in the, I mean, there is not a lot of literature available for this, uh, but um, you know, most say it's about 85% like, satisfactory outcome. And, and particularly it is effective for cats. There was a one study I remember that uh, there are, I think they've done uh, about 
nine, uh, 20 cats um, follow-ups and 19 cats you know, walk like nearly normal after six months just without any surgery. Um, so if it is just a cruciate ligament rupture, um, if it is a cat, perhaps you could try conservative treatment but need cage resting. Um, and, and it is effective for small dogs as well, like in a particularly under 15 kilos. Um, and, and if there is a high anesthetic risk, and or it is not a good candidate to go on anesthetic, or if someone is really, really concerned about the cost, um, and, and certainly it is, a, it is an option to offer, uh, you know, to rest the dog for about four to six weeks and, and then reassess. Always delaying the procedure doesn't make uh, make it uh, difficult to perform or um, doesn't have a lot of sequences. So it is an idea to, you know, rest for the results. With regard to the surgery, but in general, tendency is to do surgery. This, is condition, this condition is considered as like a surgical condition. Um, like you know, always, when there's a crochet rupture, surgery is the main thing. Um, you offer conservative when, when you know, someone can do those general tendencies to surgery because surgery is always effective. And, and uh, I think it is uh, even for cats, I think they, they, they come into but they, they walk quicker and, and they uh, use their legs uh, you know, faster. Um, so that reduced, you know, the um, other complications like um, surgery types. Uh, there are main three types of surgery. As I mentioned before, there are hundreds of uh, techniques uh, available uh, in the literature. But there are main three categories of it. The first one is extra capsular technique. Um, so one of the uh, extra capital techniques we are going to talk in detail today. And uh, there are classic names that you might see in, uh, in a literature or books and things like one is pipe drug and D angelis, and they are called extra capital. They put into one category. Um, so extra capsular means what, what we do there is like um, placing a, a nylon or sinka or some sort of a, a, a sutra outside the joint uh, in a way that it does the function of the crochet ligament. Uh, so um, to stabilize the knee. And, and it is placed outside the joint and that's why it's called extra capsule. And, and uh, so there are many, many ways of doing it. And that's why we put the names and we can do it even to describe it um, and that kind of thing. Uh, overall, this technique, uh, these techniques are simple. They're compared to the other simple, and, and, and they are the cheapest or low cost procedure, lowest cost. And, and complications are low as well. Always, if, if it didn't go well, you can redo it, or you could perform another technique uh, as well. Um, and the other thing is, this uh, extracapular technique is, um, is, is very effective, particularly for little dogs, uh, like particularly under 15 kilos. And I find personally that it's almost all dogs do well. Um, like you know, the project says in 85 to 95%. Uh, my first, I've done personally, I think about it. Maybe 700, 800 by now. And, and almost all dogs do you know, extremely well. And uh, usually they start to bear weight in about within a week or so, been usually sometimes put around 14 days. The general expectation is they put some weight on that leg within two weeks. And then uh, we, no, but we normally uh, you know, encourage using a little bit of uh, starting uh, daily activities after two weeks or so, but the normal activities uh, should not uh, resume um, until four months or so. Um, that's another thing. The, the other technique is uh, intracapsular. Intracapsular means that's a technique that they use in human, human cycle. Then the in human crucial ligament is called uh, ACL or anterior crucial ligament. Uh, 
literature and, and uh, so when they, the, the, their procedure is uh, actually trying to uh, replace the actual rhythm um, and, and that's, that's for a matter of flavor in, in veterinary industry as well and it has been tried before and described before and uh, but it is uh, it is not very effective. So it is nobody uh, performed that procedure as far as I know. Um, and the the other uh, third type is geometry modifying surgery. There are a large number of geometry modifying surgeries described, and currently uh, these are the two that is uh, uh, you know commonly performed. Um, so one is TDA, which is Tibial, tuberosity advancement. And the other procedure is TPLO, which is tibial plateau leveling osteotomy. In the inner slide, next slide, I'm going to talk about that a little bit because it's a bit confusing to also feel that this, you know, first. Um, so what, what they do with this, um, as this name sounds, uh, geometry modifying mean we change the angle of the knee. Uh, in a way that the door has to use the crucial knee. Um, so changing the angle of the knee uh, in a way that the uh, door has to the crucial knee. So how we change the angle of the knee is by um, posture, uh, by um, simply cutting the uh, here and rotating or uh, doing some changing, uh, alteration to it, and then uh, using some implants to stabilize it in that way. So that the dog doesn't need a crucial ligament, or dog doesn't need that. Uh, it doesn't happen that cranial trust force will not happen. Um, so the good thing with this technique is, like they they use leg block real quick. Um, within three days, they bear it, and um, usually can re resume normal activities within three months. Uh, really fast recovery. The most important thing is it is very effective for large dogs as well. And, and uh, it doesn't matter their size, they do really, really well. So this is pretty much like the gold standard now, like particularly um, more, if you low tend to be more popular now, uh, it's the older technique out of these two, but um, you know, there wasn't much studies until recently that which one is better, whether the TPU or TPU and some, People invested in TPA and some other invested in TPLO, but recently shown that like TPLO is a bit better um, overall. Uh, but it is out of the scope today, so uh, because this is such a big vast area, and, and uh, I think it is uh, we don't have time to talk about it today. All right, so we'll go a little bit in uh, a little bit in. About the uh, uh, about geometry modifying surgery and, and a little bit about the principle. At least the objective is at least to familiarize with the this terminology, so we don't get you know, get scared of it. Basically, um, so first thing is what is tibial plateau angle? So the tibial plateau angle um, is it. That, that's shown on the right hand side in this, this radiograph. That's how it measured. So, weight bearing axis. So this, this line is the weight bearing axis. Every textbook has described this how to, how to do this. So, we don't talk about it in detail. But this is the weight bearing uh, axis um, of the, of the tibia. And, and then the, there is another line drawn that way, and that is the tibial pattern. Or uh, that's the angle of the tibial condyle. Um, and and the, so this, this angle um, is called uh, tibial plateau. Um, and that's usually, it's about 90% dogs. It is roughly about 25 degrees around the area, but sometimes it's very really rare. This, this particular dog, it is 30 degrees. So it's more commonly uh, like it is around, around um, so these surgeries are, um, particularly the TPL load, um, so this, this, this is right here, shows uh, you know, how to, 
after uh, there's a post of Lithuania graph of um, you know, one term and two year low. And, and the ball is cut in a circular, uh, circular pattern. And Excuse me, Dr. Bagya, sorry to disturb you again. Yes. Again, we get the like uh, voice is not clear, Doctor. Okay, I'm sorry. Um, Can you hear me now? Yeah, that's better. That's better. Okay. Um, so the, with the GPLO surgery, uh, so what, what we do is um, that cut this proximal proximal tibia in a, um, in a uh, circular fashion and rotate the, the proximal fragment um, and in a way that this tibial factor um, is, um, is, is flat enough, like it's about 90 degrees, um, approximately, you know, quite around 90 degrees uh, to the rear bearing axis. We will take that uh, um, uh, to that degree, uh, the tibial the trust uh, get neutralized. So there is no uh, cranial movement of the tibia when the dog's bearing weight. But if you palpate the knee, uh, like under anesthetic, you can feel the draw sign, but the tibial trust should be negative uh, after the surgery. Um, so when you look at the other technique, which is GTA surgery, which is down below, um, that's tibial tibiosity advancement surgery. So the normal knee is shown on this side. I'm not sure what the, the lines are not cut in the tape. This place a little bit um, if you know the lines drawn here, um, I'll try to do that, but it's this place a little bit. So we'll look at this uh, this particular one now, the post of um, X ray. Uh, the tibial plateau, um, once it's perpendicular to the patellar tendon, that neutralizes the tibial crust as well. And, and basically, what happens is the patellar tendons take over the forces of uh, the cranial thrust and we maintain the angle, uh, angle of the knee in this way. And that's why um, they don't, uh, and, 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 and it, it's pretty much the same, same thing, uh, they chewed in a slightly different way. Um, so that's that's the TTA surgery. Um, and and then when you examine um, dogs that had a TTA surgery or TPLO surgery, their tibial trust is negative, but they, they have draw sign. You can move the knee, but um, you can't get the trust. Another important thing I want to mention, um, you know, in the same lecture uh, today uh, is meniscal tears. Uh, this is very common concurrent injury. Um, happens uh, usually associated with this cruciate ligament. Many scars, as I showed um, in the previous illustration, uh, so this is cushioning. And particularly this uh, medial meniscus uh, ruptures, uh, like shown in this picture here, um, is, is very common. It's common as like 33% of the cruciate ligament have, have this meniscal tear at the same time. So you, usually um, that's why uh, the first step of this surgery is to open up the, the stifle joint and inspect uh, this meniscus. And if there is any any uh, damage like this, so these uh, fragments need to be debrided uh, and cleaned as part of the surgery. Otherwise, could have a residual labels um, after the procedure. And it needs, uh, it's good to have a meniscal probe and a stifle retractor uh, to visualize this. All right, now we go to, um, now I'm going to talk about the uh, extra capsular repair. And uh, so, so the, in this category of surgeries, they, there are a large number of uh, uh, you know, Surgeries um, in the literature and in, in if you go on YouTube, you might see lots of them as well. So, um, but their their principle is the same. Uh, how how this 
how this works. Uh, so it basically, uh, it's like putting a brace on the knee um, in a way that they uh, it, it take all the function of the cruciate ligament. And when you do that, um, none of these none of these braces or none of these implants um, will last forever. Uh, usually, the effectiveness um, shows the weak, like they weaken up with the time, um, and particularly after maybe four to six months. Um, um, so they usually rely on the periarticular fibrosis. Um, you know, if they, even though we perform the surgery once we stabilize the knee. Uh, the the joint you know, the osteoarthritis progress slowly, and 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 the, as as a part of that, the joint capsule get really thickened and fibrous. And that's why we see that medial buttress as well. So these blocks we see that medial buttress. Excuse me, Doctor Bage. Yes. Sorry to disturb you again. Also, can yes. we try another like uh, the? Microscope, microphone in the computer. Is it possible for you to try? Okay, uh, give me two seconds. I'll. I'm not sure I'm not sure. Sorry, we are forcing you all, always. <laughs> yeah, that's okay. No, if you could hear, there's no, no much use to do this. Give me two seconds. I'll try another one. And any participant who has any technical uh, knowledge and advice, you are welcome to uh, like uh, advise us now. Yes, most probably the mic. Hello. Kamlita, can you hear me? Yes. No, is, it's it's better. Better. is it better or still the same? Yeah, that's great. Now it's great. Okay, okay. Hope, hope this will work this time. Um, all right, so uh, we were talking, I was talking about this um, extra capsule that we should look at. So there are a large number of techniques. Um, so all the technique works in the same way and they rely on the periarticular fibrosis, which is just like joint thickening, basically. And when we put a brace or when we put a, uh, some sort of a stabilization, do we get fibrosis in a way that the um, joint is a bit more stable? Um, so that, that's, the, that's the whole idea. So what we're going to talk about today, this is the technique that I do um, at the moment. So I um, thought, you know, share that with you guys. It's a modification of uh, DeAngelis technique. And um, so I'll go through, I mean, there are some uh, photos I put just to give a bit of a feel of it. Um, I know that it's, it's very hard to see the details in it. This, I did this, I think, last week or something. Um, so then I put some photos to, and, and, and so I could use that for the presentation. Um, I think we have a... Uh, Bye-bye. Hello. Yes. Chandika, can you hear me? Yeah, that was an outside, uh, I think, disturbance. Okay, okay, all right. So actually needs a, a practical workshop to learn, a, a, you know, practical technique. But I think for an experienced, uh, you know, orthopedic surgeon, I think, uh, you know, can, can, um, can, I think, can, can try to, um, you know, perform it based on uh, today's knowledge, I think. Uh, so I'll, I'll go through with this, uh, you know, uh, I put some steps, uh, written up some steps uh, for it. Um, the first one is um, lateral approach to the stifle. So this is the standard lateral approach that's described in this book. So you make a incision first and, uh, and uh, a couple of centimeters proximal to the, um, the patella and then extending towards the tibial humerosity. And then, uh, uh, the, then it'll expose the bicep uh, uh, fascia, muscle fascia, and then incise it. And then joint capsules um, get exposed. And the, in the third picture shows when the 
during the captain's uh, uh, exposed as well. And then we can see the, uh, there's an important instrument uh, called send retractor. Normally we use that, we use send retractor to retract the um, uh, parapatella pad pad uh, and, and retract it. Uh, retracted perennially. And then see this little white little structure is the broken pressure ligament. And um, so this stifle retractor um, is useful or you need uh, um, you know an assistant to help you with the Hohmann retractor to uh, you know open up the stifle more to, to visualize the mini sky and, and more detail. One little thing I learned all the time about this particular one is with little dogs. With uh, you know, when I perform the the the, the, the extra capsule technique, and I think this meniscal tear sometimes for some reason, um, he, when you when we stabilize the knee in this way, that even though there is meniscal tears, I haven't seen that you know um, the the it affects the outcome that much. Um, the general advice is to always clean the minister, but if you don't do it, um, don't stress about it too much, particularly when you perform this technique in the little dog. Um, so normally inspect the menisci and then uh, debride the, uh, the cruciate ligament as much as you can, um, and then uh, lavash the joint with um, you know, sterile saline, and I would close the joint with uh, Monofilament absorbable sutures. Um, it's good to use this for some doctor's pattern or CBT pattern, um, but you need to um, uh, secure the, uh, the loops uh, uh, properly. And uh, so the, the next, next step is I would normally close the joint and then move on to the actual you know, placement of the, um, the, the suture. So I have a little bit, so this is, um, uh, so what we do here is uh, placing the, the first part is facing, placing the, uh, the nylon around the um, lateral fibula, uh, which is the anchor point, um, uh, main anchor point of the um, uh, proximity. So when we perform it, um, it's very important to make sure that 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 uh, is properly. Um, so I have a little video of how I do place it. So these, these um, cruciate sutures or nylon, um, comes in two ways, and so you can get uh, the nylon uh, uh, separately and then the cruciate needle separately. So, um, now there comes like needle attached to it as well. And uh, normally um, they use, their the strength vary from uh, 50 uh, pounds to 100 pounds. And uh, for little dogs, like you know, under five kilos, I would go say 50 pounds. Uh, one, but if it's a um, you know bigger dog, uh, um, like up to um, 50 kilos or so, I would use 80 pounds. If it's a large dog, um, I would use you know 100 pounds or you know, use two strand of it. Um, I'll show you in this uh, video how to um, how do I uh, place that uh, suture on the on the fibula. The first part is the identifying the anatomy. I'm feeling from my thumb, the, the back of the, um, the femoral condyle. And uh, so my index finger is um, just proximal to the uh, fibula. And yeah. Excuse me, Dr. Bhagya. Yes. While he's playing, now there's another technical advice uh, 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 to use the laptop built-in uh, microphone is that uh, possible okay no not this one just uh... because at times it's very clear but at times like it zooms in and out in and out kind of okay let's try this way 
Uh, how is it now? Hello, Chandigarh. Yeah, at least at the moment, it's uh, better, it's better. Doctor. Okay, I'll, I'll try to stay close to the computer and, and we'll go this way. So, um, yeah, I was talking about how to, um, you know, pass the suture uh, around the lateral fibula. And this is the sesamoid bone of the gastrocnemius, um, you know, the, the, the tendon of the, of the muscle. Um, and, and first we need to help it and identify it, and then need to place the, um, the, 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 the needle around it. Um, and uh, so this, this video shows how I do it. And once, I, once you do that properly, um, this is like really strong. So on the other picture, it shows how, how it, um, how it looked like afterwards. And you can pretty much lift the leg up um, you know, without any, any issues. Like we need to feel like really solid. If not, uh, we need to reassess whether you have done it properly. Um, so yeah, this, this uh, yeah, in this uh, slide, and there is a picture on the right hand side and it shows, you know, how it goes. So this little one is the lateral fibula and that sort of goes around it. And once it goes properly, it's really, really strong. Um, and the second step is once you've done that, that part, and there's two strands coming out, um, and then I would open the, um, expose the uh, proximal tibia by, um, you know, use a um, scalpel blade and dice it the attachment of the, you know, the cranial uh, vestibular muscle. And then use a periosteal elevator and remove these uh, remaining muscle bits and expose the bone. Um, and then um, the other important uh, important step uh, is uh, drilling uh, two holes um, of um, in on the on the proximal tibia. The best this point uh, is where the at the at the level of um, where the cranial cruciate ligament attached. So when you actually do the surgery, you can't see the ligament. You don't have to look closed. Um, it's inside. But it's good idea to have a little feel of it. The second thing you could do is in some dogs, probably most dogs, on the lateral aspect of the um, of the, uh, the proximal tibia, if you palpate around here. You will feel a little, little um, uh, prominent bone here, and and uh, that's usually consistent with that uh, that uh, uh, that ligament. Is roughly about like maybe forty percent um, of the width of the, uh, you know, like the width of the proximal tibia. It's approximately about forty percent. Um, yeah, so it's different ways. I think somehow it's good to go. Um, you know, um, at the level of uh, the cranial crochet ligament, uh, you know, attachment. So the first little hole drill close to the joint, but not in the joint, but outside. First, go as proximal as possible. And there's another another hole drilled, uh, maybe a couple of millimeters um, distant. And uh, yeah, the first picture shows uh, when the, um, the, 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 the approach. Uh, um, tibial um, muscle attachment are, uh, um, you know, separated. And the second picture shows when, when drilling the, the hole, the drill guide is useful to, you know, orient the uh, direction of the hole. And you can use, or you can use a, just a, a IM pin and a, and a chuck as well, and use your hand to uh, drill the hole. And the next step is once you drill these holes and then um, then uh, the two ends that come out uh, uh, from the from the, uh, uh, from the femoral side and, and need to be inserted through the bone tunnels. So I would insert them in, in this uh, figure of eight fashion, like the, the distal uh, end goes to the proximal hole and the proximal end of the suture goes to the distant wall and comes from the other side. And once you do that, and make sure that there's no soft tissues entrapped um, 
between under the under this ligand under the uh, nylon as well and make sure that there's nothing else coming and uh, position the position the stifle uh, like roughly about 100 degrees and and then tighten the knots um, inside the um, the medial aspect of the tibia. So this is not done on the medial aspect of the tibia. So I would put at least four square knots and then cut the end of the knots uh, like you know, really short and in a way that there are no sharp pointy things. And then um, always uh, when you do the procedure, um, you need to palpate once you do the, uh, the knot, they need to have a bit of a feel. So the cranial drawer needs to be completely neutralized. You should not have that drawer sign now. And the other other important thing is but the door the, the stifle should have a, a reasonably normal range of movement. That means that knee should be able to flex properly and extend properly. Some things can feel a little bit of a restriction. Okay, but if there is a too much restriction, the dogs don't dogs wouldn't put weight on that leg much, um, and and then you will get more uh, muscle uh, atrophy and complications. So, and uh, I think it's good to revise the um, revise the suture if it is and move it a bit uh, slightly. So this is something that we need to do. Can't do too tight or can't do too loose type of a situation. It's getting to getting getting used to it every time you perform the surgery and have a little feel of the knee, the draw sign, and the range of movements, and that gives you a bit of an idea and help you to improve next time. But if there is no if there is a draw sign, that's a failure. There's no no point closing that uh, thing. You need to always have to um, replace the, um, the the suture. Uh, I'll double check the anchor point whether I have uh, got the, uh, the, the, the sutures going uh, around the fibula properly and the, uh, your anchor points need to be checked and, and addressed. So if, if things done properly, then um, if you're happy with the, um, with the range of movement and if there is no draw sign, then uh, lavage the wound um, and then perform a lignoc splash. What that means is to pretty much use double dilute and lignocaine and spray into the wound. Um, it gives a, a good recovery for you know a couple of hours, so that it was you know less agitated initially. And um, usually uh, the wound process has a routine. And then you close the muscle fascia, and so by the femoral fascia or the ligaments, so the ligaments will be able to palpate from the outside. And the other important thing is in the medial aspect of the um, the, the knot, um, I usually close, cover up with um, uh, soft tissues inside. You might see lots of um, you know um, soft tissues, and I would make sure that there's a good coverage, otherwise that could uh, cause um, irritation uh, when the skin moves then the skin moves um, over it. All right. So the, with this procedure, the post-operative care uh, outcome and you know, possible complications will briefly go through with that as well. Uh, usually they need post-operative pain relief uh, for about you know, seven to 14 days, at least seven days. Usually they become comfortable. And the second thing I would do is uh, normally give a uh, opioid as well for about three days um, with uh, inside skin. So normally we use a fentanyl patch um, for three days. Um, activity should be confined for um, two weeks, like heat resting, uh, take to toilet, uh, I think I go take on a leash and then straight back inside type um, you know, confinement. And then, uh, then probably start um, leash walks, uh, like the you know five minutes, twice daily, like small little walks, and then gradually you can start them if they're walking. Uh, and what we need to do high impact activities for about at least four months because 
uh, the the principle of uh, the surgery is like uh, rely on this periarticular fibrosis. We uh, we want to make sure that happens properly. And if the dogs did uh, jumping and you know, running and that kind of activities, that ligament that suture can get loosened up or sucked. And uh, so the periarticular fibrosis won't happen the way that we want. So the outcome, um, you know, is not as good. Uh, so that's why we can, even though the dogs don't really well, uh, still need to avoid it because it affects activities for that whole long And the expected outcome in general um, is, is, is good. Uh, our case is like 95%. I think it's almost 100% if it's a little dog. It's a large dog, we still you have a, a really good outcome if you perform the procedure well. Um, complication rights, um, generally, uh, if this is based on literature, um, 17%, about 7% need second surgery, like a small proportion of those who need a second surgery. Sometimes they come see that the nylon thing is broken or loosened. Or Sudden limping, um, really because of something to do with their activities, but people can't confirm them 100% of the time. And uh, sometimes um, it could be a failure of the procedure as well, maybe those anchor points um, and breaking of uh, the ligaments. Sometimes they can get crushed without knowing when you can't move and things like that could be crushed in the middle hole and, and, and then can break eventually. So Second surgery needed for that seven percent, and then um, the dogs with uh, higher body weight and uh, young age that need probably more than two legally dogs and uh, obese dogs are more complicated. All right, so that's uh, that's about it. Um, now I think uh, if there is any questions, I'm happy to happy to answer. Yeah, the participants now can ask either like live questions. So if you want, you can uh, type uh, so that I can direct those questions to Dr. Bhagya. And before others ask uh, technical questions, I have a comment, Dr. Bhagya. Yes. Now, as you said uh, at the beginning of the lecture, I think this is a really, really underdiagnosed uh, condition in Sri Lanka. Yes, yes I suspected that because that was my experience. I worked in Sri Lanka for a couple of years before coming here. And I felt that when I did, uh, you know, not really. Uh, okay, the, uh, huh? Okay. How many uh, do this procedure, like in Sri Lanka? Like you know, the, in in the, the other other thing is probably in the, the lifestyles of dogs are different in Sri Lanka too. So I don't think anybody has studied that as well. This is mainly the Western world. You know, the people usually take them for walks, go to parks you know, throw balls and play, that kind of thing too. In Sri Lanka, I think they, we don't have that uh, that lifestyle um, of walking and things too. Maybe that could be another reason. But do you see these you know, dogs coming with a uh, lameness like in the video much? Yeah, because no. now about five years ago, when we didn't know about this thing, about five to six years ago, like we didn't, even do these surgeries, but now increasingly we diagnose the condition after these uh, lectures and foreign trainings and all. So I yes. think definitely Sri Lanka is no exception. Even in Sri Lanka, they are, we should be doing tens of hundreds of uh, cruciate ligament rupture surgeries. Yes, that's right. So in here, like in all the all the surgeries, eighty five percent of the surgeries are cruciate surgeries. That's <laughs> it's, a staggering it's, percentage. It's, Massive amount. Like if you do three surgeries or four surgeries a day, like you know, three of them is cruciates. So that's uh, such a thing. We of course have more uh, road traffic accident related uh, surgeries, like bone 
plating or bone thinning kind of i think that's not really relevant to european and australia and those kind of countries yeah that's true too yeah because of the 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 hit by a car type thing and not very common in here but it, it happens but not as commonly as in sri lanka i think right yeah uh then uh, can you go to the uh, slide you showed us uh, with a plate <coughs> oh please yes this one ah uh, yes uh yes. in here what is the gauge of the plate we are selecting this one yes so this 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 technique is is a usually this is a, a there are four type of plates it comes in 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 you uh, know four types of you uh, know sizes normally you use a chart like you know to show you know, do this surgery and and uh, so it, it it's only four sizes like you know it goes by the you know body weight and and the tibial plateau angle so you normally when you order the implants it, it it comes with that chart so that's how you select the implant okay same same like the bone plating uh... yeah bit like bone, i mean same instrument but this now this plate is changing from time to time the more the most common one uh, you know we currently use is a um, is a partly locking plate you know couple of screws comes as a locking locking screws and the others are normal uh, you know the the like a, a normal screws uh, so the need those instruments like you know, locking um, locking instruments as well like you know locking drill guide basically and the locking pipe screws so the the screw head is locked into the plate um, so it, it depends on the supplies but there are ones that without as well like a normal dcp type plates are there too but this is a specially designed place because there is no enough room to place because it needs at least three screws on the on a segment the proximal segment yeah uh, so yeah so this is a specially designed tpl plate so need to order yeah. as a tpl plate yeah we have tpl plate but all are 2.7 Yes, I think for most dogs you can use a, a two points. Uh, most dogs mean up to maybe they are maybe they are maybe thirty thirty kilos maybe. Uh, but if it's a big dog, you might need to go with the um, you know the three point five uh, plate. I think there are four four types, and that's all available in, in the kit. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. It's okay. any other questions uh, from the audience please okay uh, can you that a suture yes um, i'm used to do uh, through the under the patella and yes. drilling through the tibia crest what is the difference between the two techniques um, I yes. mean, like, which is—is uh, uh, is there a better way? That's surgeon's preference and how you feel afterwards, I think. I used to do that way at the beginning. I mean, it's much more simpler, isn't it? So you pass in this. If you look at the screen, so you just drill one hole there and pass in one suture from from that side, and and getting that around, and and um, you can use a crimp or you can put a knot. Commonly use a crimp, isn't it? You put on that side. Do you use a crimp or crimps? Um, yeah, with yeah. the crimps. Yeah. There is no literature comparing these these techniques. Which one is better than the other? But generally, if you utilize the drawer side and if you um, has to have a a good range of movements, I think that's fine. Mm -hmm. um, there is no one is better than the other one. But I found this one when you. When I do this way, um, you know, I find in, in particularly in big dogs, it's um, it's much more solid, and it doesn't uh, one my other end doesn't run through the soft tissues much, and and um, I feel um, it is better, and I've seen uh, uh, you know uh, better outcome. So I change over to this one. 
Um, right. These teachers are equal. Because okay. my knot is, I mean, in, in some people say that if you put a knot, um, you know, the creams are bigger than putting knots uh, as well. Uh, because the knots sometimes could, you know, irritate the uh, soft tissue as well, particularly with the dermis and things. But if you do that knot, um, uh, in a, this knot is very stationary as well. It is on the other side, there's no much room to move. And if you come up with soft tissue, um, it, Personal preference, I think. But if you feel your one has a, you know, it, it neutralizes the drawer sign, and if uh, if the if has a good range of movements, I think it, I think stick with it. Right. Thank you, Bud. That's okay. Any other questions from the audience? If you want, you can type the questions also. If you don't want to ask questions, I can read them out to Dr. Bhagya. Uh, Dr. Bhagya, hello. Yeah, can I, hello, yeah, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Uh, Dr. Bhagi, if any pet is having hip dysplasia, so, uh, and with persons with um, cruciate ones, so what is your preference towards uh, the correct at the same time, or you will do a FHO first and uh, we will proceed with the cruciate second? Yes, that's a really, really good question. Uh, then, then they have, uh, you know, hip dysplasia uh, as well. So what do you do? Um, it's over almost all the time dogs limbs because of the cruciate, not because of the hip dysplasia. Um, it is even though those radiographic changes in the, uh, the hip joint, um, it's it's uh, it's very rare that they correlate with the actual lameness. And um, particularly that's why it's very important to understand uh, in a local uh, 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 localizing the pain, like where the pain comes from. And if you have radiographic evidence of hip dysplasia, um, we always ignore the hip hips uh, treat the knee. Thanks a lot. That's okay. So, so you would uh, do the uh, cruciate ligament uh, surgery? Yes, do the cruciate ligament surgery. The hip for the hip dysplasia, I mean. Uh, there is nothing. I mean, unless you do a hip replacement, um, the other there is no other good uh, you know, treatments like the femoral head and neck resection uh, is the other treatment. And um, so almost all the time, um, then then it comes to a uh, if if the hips are bad as you know with, uh, that needs uh, Do you do hip replacement in Sri Lanka? I don't think so. Not to my knowledge, no. No, isn't it? So if, unless you, if hip replacement is very effective, like 95% um, effective, like they walk like normal. And unless you do that, I mean, there is no other good treatment. The, the hip and the hip um, femoral head and neck resection is a salvage procedure. So when a dog limping that bad, because that happens much earlier than, uh, um, you know, this cruciate ligament. So normally it doesn't get confused. Usually get confused when you do x-rays. Now, the dog's limping, and then you take x-rays, and you see changes in the hips. So I think just um, uh, address the hip joint. It's, we know that, you know, hips not great, but um, usually that is not the cause of lameness. It, uh, it is almost all the time, it is the knee. And also, there is a request, uh, Dr. Bagge, from the final year students uh, to have your PowerPoint presentation, if possible. Yeah, that's okay. I'm happy to do that. I'll, I'll, um, I can email this to you, or, uh, Sugat, and yes, that's okay. Yeah, if you can email to Dr. Sugat, then uh, he should be able to send it to the faculty. Okay, okay. Okay, I will do it. Any more questions from the audience before we wrap up?
until members like uh, get their questions can i ask another question dr bagge yes yes sandeep now you have a actually this is a actual case now i have a, a one and a half year old uh, pitbull terrier yes diagnosed a cruciate ligament yes right side is worse and there's left side also and there's some degree of hip dysplasia yes very bad owners in a sense they love their pet they would spend any amount of money but they would not uh, do cage resting all those things and dog is also a little bit hyper so what would be your practical advice yes i think doing uh, doing this extra capsular surgery is better than doing nothing uh, for that sort of you know breed dogs um, and then particularly if it's active one is good to do it but if if the owner didn't wasn't compliant with it i think they need to Yeah, that you know you might need to repeat it again. Sometimes you can redo it. Like if it, you know if if the ligament gets loosened up, we can go back in and do it again. The other thing you could do is I want you know so, uh, that as well. You can put two ligaments, um, like you know in both sides. Like this is um, you know we we place this on the lateral side, and same way you could put this on the medial side as well on that dog. so it's much more stronger and all right uh, and uh, yeah then it's a bit more uh, bit more stable i think and using double strands so what size of uh, nylons do you use like do you also use this uh, 100 pound nylon or i am not familiar with those can dr sugatha or dr dani can please comment i yeah, don't yeah. do this surgery doctor we use the 100 pound ones uh, the standard uh, ones with the cream yeah. of in the cream so you could do that to do in either side as well that that's another another thing that could try but i, I don't think there is literature or anything available to you know analyze it but practically you know, i've seen people do it and i have done myself as well for for that kind of dogs like you know boisterous big dogs that the other surgeries are not an option and i think that way the the stability is better and stronger and then then try to convince them probably the owner would try to um, you know convince that you know it's very important uh, to do it if not there is a risk that we have to do this again if it loses enough we can get them to bring the dog back in a while maybe a month or so and have a feel even this i mean usually get loose enough like if um even though you do it properly as well I and mean, if you examine this dog one year later like you will see oh, there's a little bit of movement um it's almost all the time there is a little bit of movement later on um but if you see that movement like within a month or so i think and plus if the dog is not bearing weight well i think i would repeat it particularly if if um, if the owner can't keep the dog you know confined and things like that they're really hard so even in a hyper dog with less owner compliance we are not losing anything by attempting no, no, that no not to lose that's ah, that's right, a okay. point there is nothing much to lose i mean you might help a little bit you know worst case it may not work that's all unless right. you know if you maintain a good sterility and all that i mean there is otherwise there's a risk of infection even yeah. we can other point is we can remove this ligament after 6 months if it cause a problem like you know suture retention or some sort of a some some dogs can have a you know draining sinus tract or something like that if there is a, something is we suspect infection related thing uh, because we don't want to leave a foreign body inside you can remove it even after 6 months um, because the stability we don't expect to last more than 6 months that's another so point trying to surgery what are we expecting doctor like uh, do the ligaments reform uh, yeah no no uh, the fibrosis the actual ligament is gone forever and the periarticular fibrosis the thickening of the joint capsule it happens a bit better way when you when you stabilize it if in a unstable right. knee it it, it 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 doesn't happen uh, in a, in a stable way that joint capsule get thicken um, like you know it get thicker like maybe 1 cm thick thought thing uh, over time Like if you feel right. like if a dog had a cruciate extracapsular surgery or cruciate rupture when they're young, and if you do a surgery for something else, like later on, like few years later, that joint capsule is really thick. 
and it's very hard to go into the joint too. Like there's lots of little blood vessels and lots of scar tissue. So that's why right. these techniques are, are for big dogs. But PPLO and ATA type things. And there's another question from the audience doctor, from Dr. Dammika. What about the application of these techniques for small ruminants? Do you have any experience? No, I don't have any experience, but I think it should work if, if, it is a pro if, if there is a problem. But I don't know whether they, there is a crucial doctor. Have they diagnosed it? Is, is Dr. Dam Dammika online? Dr. Damika, are you here still? I think he's but not here. Cats, the same technique. With regard to the cats, I'll mention a quick thing. With cats, it's almost it's trauma related. And usually they damage multiple ligaments as well. Like the usually collateral ligaments are damaged too. That's why they are um, if, if you found a cat, it's very loose and very unstable. And the, the same way that you could do the surgery, like it's exactly the same way, use of small uh, suture, and, and uh, maybe you could uh, you know, repair the actual damage other ligaments too, collateral ligaments too at the same time. But if you do this uh, suture, that stabilizes it a lot uh, in, in cats. Like even though with multiple ligament injuries, if you do just this, it should be enough. Okay, are there any more questions? We have about 10 more minutes uh, if you have questions. Was it clear, Chandika, what I said? Like, you know, the disturbances and everything. At times, it wasn't uh, very clear, Doctor. There was like well, zooming in and out kind of. Uh, uh, the voice was zooming in and out, kind of. Okay. Okay, if there are no other questions, we want to like uh, thank Dr. Bhagya. Like, uh, uh, there's another question. Question, give me a minute. Uh, I know that's a comment only. Thank you very much, Dr. Bhagya and the team here who are behind the program. So I would like to then invite Dr. Sugat Premachandra, uh, Secretary SLVA, to do the formal vote of thanks. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Chandika. Uh, Dr. Randika Kunavardana, the President of Sri Lanka Veterinary Association, Dr. Bhagya, our research person today, uh, dear doctors, uh, on behalf of the 73rd Executive Committee, uh, I would like to um, extend our sincere gratitude to Dr. Bhagya, our resource person today, who accepted our invitation as resource person despite his busy schedule. And uh, it's really important, informative and attractive webinar. Thank you very much, Bhagya, for your support to uh, our veterinarian in Sri Lanka. At the same time, I would like to thank Dr. Chandigarh Vikram Singh, for your support as moderator. I would like to thank all the participants today, doctors, students, and uh, 73rd Executive Committee members uh, for your participant, particip participation to success to the event. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone.